Well, can I welcome everyone uh, to the Red Line Chambers webinar, Still Draining the Swamp, Unexplained Wealth Orders and the War on Dirty Money. Welcome to all of you. Um, we are very, very lucky to have two panellists. I'm afraid the third panellist, I'll explain in a moment, it wasn't able to join us. We have David Wallbank of Queen's Council from Redline Chambers. Uh, most of you probably don't need an introduction uh, to David, uh, who is uh, an expert uh, on all aspects of financial fraud and wider than that, and you'll discover uh, an expert on unexplained wealth orders. We are also fortunate to have Leon Chua, who is a partner uh, at <laughs> Jackson and Leon, who also has had a, a wide range of work involving financial fraud and also has advised clients on this area. Uh, we're very sorry that Ruby Hamid, uh, who is a partner at Ashurst, who was due to be with us, can't join us today, um, mainly because um, I think she's been advising for the last few weeks on uh, aspects of sanctions uh, uh, in various countries, and you probably have guessed which country particularly that uh, uh, her firm is concerned with. Um, May we then start, we've got far more than an hour's worth of webinar to deal with and therefore, uh, without further ado, uh, David, in a nutshell, what is, please, an unexplained wealth order? Uh, well, I suppose the broad contours of the regime are pretty well established. Uh, in very broad terms, uh, an unexplained wealth order is an order made by the High Court against a named individual or entity uh, which identifies specific property worth at least £50,000 and which requires the recipient of the order to explain their interest in that property and how they obtained that interest and to supply any information relating to the property which is stipulated by the order. The recipient of the order, the respondent, then has a fixed period of time as specified by the court granting the order to respond to it and depending on the precise terms of the order in question, the response may have to include written answers or the production of documents or other evidence. And the essential aim of the unexplained wealth order regime is to try to put law enforcement agencies into a position to confiscate criminal assets without ever having to prove in criminal proceedings that the property in question was obtained from criminal activity. They are, strictly speaking, nothing more than an investigative tool um, intended to ease the path towards the obtaining of a civil recovery order. They're targeted specifically at two main categories of person, uh, individuals with links to serious crime and individuals who hold public office outside Europe. And the main way in which they seek to achieve their aim of, as I said, easing the path towards obtaining a CRO is that if the person served with the unexplained wealth order fails to comply with it, uh, law enforcement can then apply to the court for a civil recovery order with the benefit of a presumption that the property in question is recoverable property and should be confiscated. If, on the other hand, uh, the person served with the unexplained wealth order does comply with the order and the information supplied is true and accurate, it may well be the key that unlocks the investigation into whether that property is indeed the proceeds of crime. And I suppose the the third possible scenario is that if information is supplied in purported compliance with the order, but it turns out to be untrue, certain penal consequences may flow. So, so that's the essential scheme of this regime. Thank you, David. Um, I suppose it's right to say that for many years now, the UK has been seen as a hub for dirty money, especially London's prime property market. Uh, the question of how to tackle this problem uh, has a long and slightly tortuous history. Uh, Leon, are you able to pinpoint any particular key development uh, in relation to this area relating to dirty money? Yes, well, um, a key event in the developing of the phenomenon of dirty money washing in the UK appears to be the introduction in 1994 of the UK Investor Visa Scheme. Um, in the recent report of the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament on Russia, uh, which is in July 2020, the committee fastened on that particular historical development. Um, it discussed what it was that had first attracted 
Russian oligarch to London. Um, and the committee said, and I quote, um, it's widely recognized that the key to London's appeal was the exploitation of the UK's investor visa scheme introduced in 1994, followed by the promotion of a light and limited touch to regulation with London's strong capital and housing market offering sound investment opportunities. The UK rule of law and the judicial system were also seen as a draw. They welcomed Russian money and few questions, if any, were asked about the provenance of this considerable wealth. What is now clear is that the fact was that it's in fact counterproductive in that it offered ideal mechanisms by which illicit finance could be recycled through what has been referred to as the London laundromat. So essentially, the investor scheme has now closed in February this year, but this was the view back in 2020. And it was looking back into the original introduction of the UK investor visa scheme back in 1994. Yeah, and I think Leon is right, isn't it? That it was only, um, I think three or four years after that investor visa scheme came in, in the mid nineties, I think it was in October 98, that the then Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, commissioned a report by the Cabinet Office's Performance and Innovation Unit, if we can go on to the next slide please, um, that looked at the effectiveness of the measures in place to pursue and remove criminal assets and that report which was published uh, 18 months later in June of 2000, concluded that the UK's confiscation track record is poor, uh, very little is ordered to be confiscated, and even less is collected. And it was really that that led on to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the enactment of the Proceeds of Crime Act of 2002, which introduced what was then a new tool, the Civil Recovery Order, uh, which I've already mentioned in my opening remarks, so we probably don't need to go back up Go, go back on to. Um, it had uh, rather uh, limited use. It was limited to exceptional cases. Uh, in fact, some guidance was issued by the Attorney General in 2012. Next slide, please. Uh, the Asset Recovery Powers for Prosecutors Guidance and Background Notes of 2009 was updated in November of 2012, and it stated that the reduction of crime is in general best secured by means of criminal investigations and criminal proceedings. However, the non-conviction based asset recovery powers available under POCA can also make an important contribution to the reduction of crime where it's not feasible to secure a conviction or where a conviction is obtained but a confiscation order isn't made or where a relevant authority is of the view that the public interest will be better served by using those civil powers, civil asset recovery powers, rather than by seeking a criminal disposal. And, and I think, Leon, it's probably right to say, isn't it, that the next key event was a speech by the uh, later Prime Minister in, in, in July 2015. Yes, that's correct. In um, July 2015, a speech in Singapore, a country that I'm very familiar with, uh, David, David Cameron, the then Prime Minister, actually said, I'm determined that the UK must not become a safe haven for corrupt money from around the world. We need to stop corrupt official and organized criminals using anonymous shell companies to invest their ill-gotten gains in London properties without being tracked down. There is no place for dirty money in Britain. Indeed, there should be no place for dirty money anywhere. This is my message to foreign fraudsters. London is not a place to stash your dodgy cash. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid those words are probably going to ring rather hollow um, for most of us looking at what's happened um, since. But there it is. That's that's the view that the then Prime Minister David Cameron was expressing in that speech in 2015. And then in 2016, HMG, the government published its action plan for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist finance. We can probably skip through these slides fairly rapidly. Um, the, the plan talked about new powers to impose an obligation on an individual or entity to explain the source of their wealth in support of an investigation. And uh, uh, as we see on the slide now on screen, it finished with the thought that the government would explore options for new legal powers, unexplained wealth orders, which were already in use in Ireland and Australia, to tackle the problem. And that a UWO, when served on a defendant, would require him to explain to the court uh, 
the origin of his or her assets. And that led directly uh, to the Criminal Finances Bill, which was introduced into Parliament in October 16, received the Royal Assent in April of 17, uh, sections one to six of the bill and subsequently the statute introduced unexplained wealth orders by inserting new sections into the Proceeds of Crime Act of 2002 and the, the new uh, panoply of measures came into force finally on the 31st of January of 2018. So that's a very long answer to your question, Salesh, about the legislative and consultative history, but that's a, a brief canter through the history of how we got to where we are now. So, so David, Leon, on paper, it looks like an area that's been um, uh, well thought through in that two prime ministers have tried to speak of dodgy money and on the face of it sought to attack the source of dodgy money. We've had two major bills, POCA and the, the Criminal Finances Bill. Can we just quickly now turn to the legalities? Uh, firstly, three key questions for the two of you. Um, who can uh, apply uh, for a UWO? Uh, who or what can be the subject of a UWO? And what are the legal consequences of obtaining the order? So taking each of those in turn, uh, Leon, who can apply uh, for an unexplained wealth order? So the legislation states that only an enforcement authority can apply for a for an unexplained wealth order. Um, an enforcement authority for these purposes is any of the following, the National Crime Agency, um, Her Majesty Revenue and Customs, the Financial Conduct Authority, the Director of the Serious Fraud Office or the Director of Public Prosecutions. Other bodies cannot apply for unexplained wealth order. If they wanted to obtain one, they would have to refer a case to one of these named enforcement authorities. Yeah, uh, and so only specific authorities can. Um, it follows, uh, David, that a private individual would have uh, would find it impossible unless they persuaded one of these authorities to do so. Yes, um, <clears throat> I suppose I ought not to express my cynicism too openly, but this is this is at least one powerful investigative tool that's not going to be available to the panoply of new private prosecution firms that we seem to have operating in the criminal justice system these days. Um, I shouldn't say that, sounds a little facetious. Um, or, or, or indeed to uh, many of the other organisations that do engage in prosecutions in the public sphere. Um, it's, a very, it's a very limited range of <clears throat> public prosecution agencies that can use the powers under the statute. And in fact, as we'll see later, only one of them, the National Crime Agency, has in fact ever made applications for unexplained wealth orders. The, the Serious Fraud Office at one stage uh, was said to be trawling through um, all of its existing case work to see whether it had any obvious candidates to be the subject of applications for UWOs. But, but in fact, it seems that nothing came of that. And as I say, I think it's the NCA, only the NCA that's ever applied for UWOs thus far, at least. Thank you. Um, Leon, you've dealt with the question, who can apply for the order? Uh, the next of the three questions is, who or what can be the subject of an unexplained wealth order? Yeah, so the subject of an unexplained wealth order, there, there are two categories of people that can be served with this order. Firstly, the so-called politically exposed persons, also known as PEPs. Um, these are people with prominent public functions, such as ministers, MPs, ambassadors, um, as well as their family members, known close associates and other connections. Uh, the logic behind that is because of their positions, PEPs present a higher risk than other individuals. The PEP concept is well established in money laundering and definition to be used for determining whether someone is a family member or known close associate of a PEP. This is taken from the fourth money laundering directive. Um, an order can only be obtained against a foreign PEP who holds their prominent public function outside the UK or the EEA, the European Economic Area. Um, even after Brexit, this remains the case, even though the UK is now left the EEA. The second category of person that can be served with an order is someone who is suspected 
unreasonable grounds of being involved in a serious crime or who's connected with someone so involved. These two categories of persons are freestanding and alternatives. So for example, if someone is a PEP, there's no need to show that they have been involved in a serious crime. Likewise, if someone is involved in serious crime, there's no need to show that they are also politically exposed. So David, what are the consequences then of legal consequences of obtaining uh, a w, UWO? Uh, so if I can deal with it in this way, if I can ask for the next slide, yes, I can see it's on screen. Um, essentially, uh, section 362A, subsection three answers your question. I'll read it out in full, if I may, because it, it is an answer to the question. An unexplained wealth order is an order requiring the respondent to provide a statement, A, setting up the nature and extent of the respondent's interest in the property in respect to which the order is made, B, explaining how the respondent obtained the property, including in particular how any costs incurred in obtaining it were met, and C, where the property is held by the trustees of settlement, setting out such details of the settlement as may be specified in the order, and D, setting out such other information in connection with, forgive the American spelling of connection there, my fault, uh, in connection with the property as may be so specified. I, I dealt in my opening remarks with really the practical consequences. If the respondent fails to uh, respond to the order without reasonable excuse, uh, the presumption applies and the property will become recoverable property for the purposes of a uh, civil um, a civil recovery. Um, if the respondent uh, complies or purports to comply, that presumption will not apply, and the enforcement authority then needs to determine what, if any, enforcement or investigative proceedings are to be taken in relation to the property. And if, if there's an interim freezing order in place, and we'll come to those later, uh, the enforcement authority has to make that determination within 60 days of the date in which the respondent complied or purported to comply with the order. That's called the determination period, the initial 60 days in which the uh, application for the, the applicant for the order, the agency that first obtained the order, has to decide, frankly, what to do next in the light of the response they've received. So those are the, the main legal consequences of the, the making of the order. And, and David, is it a criminal offence to fail to comply with the order? Uh, no, it's not actually. Um, uh, it, it is uh, an offence for a person in purported compliance with a requirement imposed by an unexplained wealth order to make a statement that the person knows to be false or misleading in a material particular or uh, for that person recklessly to make a statement that is false or misleading in a material particular, that, that is an offence. But failure to comply full stop is not in itself an offence. The, the sanction, so to speak, the, the disadvantage, the prejudice that's suffered by the recipient in failing to comply is that that pr presumption that I've talked about applies so that the property of the subject of the order will become recoverable and is likely to be the subject of a civil asset recovery order. Uh, I, I imagine, David, given the huge impact uh, that uh, such an order would have uh, on a person, uh, personal as well as uh, their rights being impacted, there would be a number of hurdles that the applicant authority would have to get over and to persuade the court about. Yes, there are. Um, essentially, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, essentially five requirements, but the last two in the alternative, so, so four hurdles really in any particular application. Uh, and they can be simply stated, uh, the holding requirement, the value requirement, uh, the so-called income requirement, and then either the serious crime requirement or the politically exposed person requirement. As I say, those last two, either the serious crime requirement or the politically exposed person requirement, those are alternatives. Uh, but, but, but four out of five, an applicant would have to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the court in order to obtain the order in the first place. Uh, therefore, the first, and, and some might say the most important hurdle, is the holding requirement. What, what is the holding requirement? Uh, the, the holding requirement is set out in section 362A, subsection 2, uh, which is now on screen. I won't read it out, it's there for all of us to see. Um, a person holds property under the Proceeds of Crime Act 
if they have an interest in it. Th these are really very familiar concepts. I'm almost embarrassed to go over them, but summarizing it as, as succinctly as I can, um, a person holds property under POCA if they have an interest in it, namely any legal estate or equitable interest in or power in respect to the property. It's possible, obviously, for more than one person to hold a property at the same time. Uh, and the circumstances in which a person will be taken to hold property for the purposes of an unexplained wealth order application include, but are not limited to, each of the following circumstances. Where that person has effective control over the property, where that person is the trustee of the settlement in which the property is comprised, where the person is a beneficiary, whether actual or potential, in relation to such a settlement. And a person will be taken to have effective control over the property if it's reasonable to conclude from all the circumstances that that person exercises or is able to exercise or is entitled to acquire direct or indirect control over the property in question. So as our viewers will see, that's a very wide definition, capable of encompassing persons who are in possession of the property. And in fact, I should say that the explanatory notes to the Criminal Finances Act of 2017 said in terms that the definition of holding property was deliberately broad and was meant to be broad enough to address circumstances where property was held either in trust or owned in a complex corporate structure arrangement. Um, there is specific provision that a company or other body corporate may hold property regardless of whether that company is incorporated or formed under the law of a part of the United Kingdom or elsewhere. And then finally, in relation to the holding requirement, and again, I'm conscious this is familiar territory for all of us, but uh, under section 362B, subsection two, there has to be reasonable cause to believe that the person holds the property. Uh, plainly, it's for the enforcement authority to satisfy the court that that threshold test is met. Uh, the test whether the applicant actually believes that to be the case is subjective. Belief doesn't require a firm conviction. It's a, it's a more positive frame of mind than suspicion. Um, and whilst the question whether the applicant actually holds that belief is subjective, the question whether there is reasonable cause for that belief is obviously objective. So that, that's, a, again, a very quick canter through the, the so-called uh, holding requirement. It really brings in a number of um, concepts that will be familiar to all of us from, from other areas of the law in which we deal, and they've been pulled together uh, under, under the, um, the rubric, under the heading of that requirement, of the, the holding requirement. And I suppose, David, those that are advising the recipients or the respondents to such an application might be forgiven for thinking that the reasonable cause hurdle is a little too low from the, the, the respondent's point of view? Uh, they might. Um, I won't express my own view. Uh, I think what I'll say, uh, play devil's advocate and say that the government that introduced the legislation and the authorities that enforce it would probably respond, saying that a, a, an unexplained wealth order is not a uh, procedure or a process or a remedy which can in and of itself affect anybody's property rights. It's an investigative tool. It's a step on the path towards uh, an application for a civil uh, asset recovery order. But the, the UWO itself doesn't change anybody's property rights, doesn't change the status of property. It is strictly speaking an investigative tool. And, and I, I suppose they would say by analogy, that is why you have this phrase, reasonable cause to belief, which mirrors other investigative powers which are available to the police at an early stage of an investigation. But as I say, I won't express my own opinion. That's playing devil's advocate. I suspect that's what the government would say and the enforcement authorities would say. Thank you. Um, Leon, we've, we've dealt therefore with the first hurdle, first requirement, um, which is the holding requirement. Can we deal with the second uh, hurdle, which is the value requirement? Yes, so the value requirement is only met if the court is satisfied that there is reasonable cause to believe um, that the value of the property in relation to which the applicant is seeking an unexplained wealth order 
is greater than £50,000. Um, so where, for example, the property comprises of more than one item of property, it is the total value of those items that matters. Um, reasonable cause to believe in relation to the value requirements has the same meaning as the relationship to the holding requirements that David has just discussed moments ago. Yeah, thank you, Leon. Um, David, I suppose that one would really be thinking about people who, uh, in relation to value, uh, where you're looking at hundreds of thousands, if not millions, rather than the 50,000 low threshold. Um, is there also an income requirement hurdle? Uh, th there is, and this is probably the most important of the lot. Um, I would have thought. Uh, the, the income requirement uh, requires the court to be satisfied that there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that the known sources of the respondents lawfully obtained income would have been insufficient for the purposes of enabling that respondent to obtain the property in question. And for these purposes, income is lawfully obtained if it's obtained lawfully under the laws of the country where the income arises and a source of income is a known source if its income, whether that arises from employment or from assets or otherwise, um, income from a known source that's reasonably ascertainable from available information at the time that the application is made. Now, um, for, for once, the, the code of practice that applies uh, to uh, the operation of the UWO regime, uh, commonly referred to as the revised code of practice, strictly speaking, as we see on the slide, the code of practice issued under section 377 of POCA, does actually shed some quite useful light on the concept of the income requirement. The relevant passage is set out there, uh, paragraph 176 of the code, uh, the enforcement authority should carefully consider the value of evidence that may be obtained through a UWO, a UWO provides law enforcement with a tool to obtain information and documentation in relation to property that appears to be disproportionate to the known income of an individual or company. A fundamental aim of the power, therefore, is to access evidence that would otherwise not be available. Uh, and then the next slide, please. Paragraph 177. Applicants should be able to explain to the court uh, the basis for their suspicion by reference to disclosable intelligence or information about or some specific behavior by the individual or company concerned, including open source material from overseas, where there may be public registers relating to property and to public servants income. And then finally, on the same slide, paragraph 178, applicants should take reasonable steps to liaise with other agencies in order to establish whether they already own material that explains a person's wealth and to ensure appropriate action, thereby avoiding duplicating inquiries that may already be underway. And then finally, next slide, please. This is quite important. Uh, that The Act takes into account that most real property is going to be purchased with the benefit of finance of, of one sort or another, uh, whether by mortgage or some other charge. And, and therefore, section 362B, subsection 6, provides that regard is to be had to any mortgage charge or other kind of security that it's reasonable to assume was or may have been available to the respondent for the purpose of obtaining, that is, purchasing the property. It's to be assumed that the respondent obtained the property for a price equivalent to its market value. So all, all of those are useful uh, pieces of guidance to be taken into account by an applicant, by those representing the respondent, and ultimately by the court in deciding whether the so-called income requirement is met in any particular case. Thank you, David. Uh, we then turn to the fourth uh, requirement, which is the serious crime requirement. What is that? Uh, again, next slide, please. Section 362B, <clears throat> subsection 4B. Uh, the serious crime requirement is met if the court is satisfied that there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that the respondent is or has been involved in serious crime, whether in a part of the UK or elsewhere, or is a person connected with, sorry, or a person connected with the respondent uh, is or has been so involved, that is, is or has been involved uh, in serious crime. Uh, now, again, usefully, uh, the question of who is a person connected with the respondent, uh, there is an express statutory cross-reference to uh, 
section 1122 of the Corporation Tax Act of 2010. The next slide, please. I'm sounding like Professor Whitty, aren't I? Next slide, please. Uh, section 1122, subsections three and four. Uh, a company is connected with another person, A, if A has control of the company or A, together with persons connected with A, have control of the company. And in relation to a company, any two or more persons acting together to secure or exercise control of the company are connected with one another and with any other person acting on the directions of any of them to secure or exercise control of the company. And um, I mean, there are more provisions about what, it, what, me, what is meant by serious crime, but that, that again is very uh, familiar territory. I'm not going to take up the time of our viewers this evening by looking at all the provisions on that. That, that is pretty clear. So that, that's essentially the uh, so-called serious crime requirement, which is the first of the, the two alternative final hurdles that need to be jumped by the applicant enforcement agency in seeking the unexplained wealth order. And, and therefore the, the second part of that, Leon, uh, is the politically exposed person requirement, which can, uh, I'm assuming, can be quite a difficult one uh, for either the recipient of the allegation or for the maker of the allegation to prove. Yeah, so as I explained previously, the politically exposed person is an alternative to the serious crime requirements. Um, according to section 362b subsection 7, which is on the screen now, politically exposed person means a person who is a an individual who is or has been entrusted with prominent public functions by an international organization or by a state other than the United Kingdom or another EEA state. Um, some assistance in understanding this concept can derive be derived from Parliament and Council Directive 2015-849-EU, which, ex which expressly referenced by Section 362B, Subsection 8 of POCA 2002. Article 3 of the 2015 Directive contains a definition of polit politically exposed persons, um, which is on the screen again. Um, it means a natural person who is or has been entrusted with a prominent public function and includes the following a head of state, head of government, head of government, ministers and deputy or ministers, B members of parliament or other similar legislative bodies. It goes on to explain other types of um, politically exposed persons. So it is clear from the authorities that there is no requirements that in order to rank as a politically exposed person, the individual in question must have had a public functions actually conferred upon him by the international organization or by a state. The statutory focus is on the fact that the individual expressed exercised public functions rather than on how those functions um, came to be conferred upon him. The significance of the reference to functions having been conferred by an international organization or by a state other than the UK or EEA state is to exclude from the definition of a PEP um, those who exercise prominent public functions either within the UK or within the EEA state. Thank you. Um, David, before we go on to look at some practical scenarios, we've just mm -hmm. uh, therefore had a, a quick run through of a PEP um, and we've had a quick uh, analysis of the serious crime requirements. I suppose those are the key things that will be the knottiest problems uh, in uh, such an application. Mm -hmm the battleground between the parties? Uh, yes, I think that's right. Um, and, and of course, in the end, uh, every case is going to turn on its own facts. And, 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 and I suspect, suspect what might um, benefit uh, your viewers is trying to get a feel for what in the real world is the sort of situation in which uh, applications for UWOs are being made and uh, granted. Uh, but yes, you're right. Uh, th 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 those five requirements are the key battlegrounds on any application uh, which is made by an enforcement agency. Thank you. David, I think we're now going to turn to some, um, some uh, real world scenarios and we can yeah. see that we've got the next slide up with three key cases. And uh, um, I, I know you're too modest to do a plug about this, but is, I think it's right uh, that I should give a plug 
uh, to Crimecast, uh, which if those listening and watching have not heard of, uh, I would certainly encourage you immediately to, uh, to get on to Crimecast, which is something that David Wallbank uh, has been uh, instrumental in. In fact, uh, David, I, I, I listen to Crimecast regularly myself, and I know that the, those, the, your analysis of cases in Crimecast uh, is second to none. Uh, and I know some of these cases have been covered on Crimecast as well. Salish, I'm blushing. Um, I'm not sure I entirely believe you when you say that you regularly listen to it, but there it is. Uh, seamlessly done. <clears throat> uh, the, the answer to the question about the, the, the sorts of situations in which uh, applications can be made and succeed is, as you say, probably to look at the, the three main cases which have been reported, the citations of which are there. Um, uh, it's very kind of you to refer to Crimecast. You've been just about justified on the basis that I've done uh, fairly detailed reviews on, I think, two of three, Haji Ava and Hussein. I don't think I did do Baker at the time. Uh, for those who are um, masochists or devils for punishment, they can watch the full 20 minute review of each of them. Uh, they're very fact heavy. Uh, for those who really can't bear 20 minutes of listening to me talking, there, there is a five minute version, I think, of each of them, which gives you the key essentials. Um, uh, it, it, uh, I suspect I probably shouldn't spend any time now talking in detail um, about the facts of those cases. Uh, they'll be pretty familiar to most of those. Uh, in a nutshell, and I really do mean in, in one or two sentences, <clears throat> excuse me, Haji Ava um, was a pretty well-known case. It was the, the very first unexplained wealth order to be issued in February of 2018, less than a month after these orders became available. And essentially, uh, the facts were that Mrs. Zamira Haji Ava was a national of Azerbaijan and was married to Mr. Jahangir Hajiev who in March 2001 had been appointed chairman of the International Bank of Azerbaijan, which was the largest bank in the Democratic Republic of Azerbaijan, and the state had a shareholding of not less than 50.2% in it. And essentially the facts were um, that uh, she appeared at face value <clears throat> to be the owner through a BVI company of a, a fabulously um, opulent and ostentatious property in Knightsbridge, uh, and the authorities suggested that in fact it had been funded by her husband uh, through ill-gotten gains um, in his um, activities in Azerbaijan. He'd actually been prosecuted and convicted by the Azerbaijani authorities. They, they took account of all those matters, placed them before the court, and succeeded in obtaining an unexplained wealth order uh, against Mrs. Hajiev. She applied to discharge it, uh, the discharge application was rejected. Uh, she appealed on a number of technical grounds, all of which were roundly rejected. And as I understand it, um, she uh, is still required to provide the information under that unexplained wealth order, and the case is still ongoing. So, so that's a good example of the politically exposed person limb in action, if you like. And then again, very briefly, uh, Hussein, NCA and Hussein, uh, reported at 2021 weeklies 2145. That's the other limb, that's the serious crime limb. And the background was that the National Crime Agency suspected that a man called Mansour Mahmoud Hussein was involved in serious criminality in connection with the activities of organized crime groups operating in the Bradford area and across the north of England. Essentially, they said that he was using his skills to hold property um, through which the proceeds of crime were being laundered. Uh, I think he'd formed and dissolved numerous companies over the years. Uh, they made an application under the, <coughs> excuse me, the serious crime limb. Uh, the application was granted uh, in relation to eight separate properties. And thereafter, uh, Mr. Hussein submitted no less than, no fewer than 127 major arch files of evidence in response to the UWO. Uh, the NCA then unsurprisingly said that he'd given the game away, let the cat out of the bag, any phrase you choose to use in the information he'd given, and that they could now mount an even bigger case against him. And Mr. Sain saw the writing on the wall and compromised the case, agreed an out of court settlement with the NCA, in which he handed over 45 different properties and other assets with a combined value of almost 10 million. And then finally, the case of Baker. Um, to be fair, slightly less helpful perhaps in illustrating the circumstances in which one of these orders can be obtained because it turned into something of a fiasco for the uh, National Crime Agency. 
in May of 19, they obtained uh, UWOs and related interim freezing orders. Uh, they argued that the properties had been purchased using the laundered funds originating from a man called Rakat Aliyev, a Kazakh national who'd had several senior political roles in Kazakhstan as deputy foreign minister uh, before falling out with the regime in 2007. Uh, the respondents to the orders applied to have them set aside. They succeeded in having them set aside. The High Court finding that the NCA's case was flawed and that it depended on unreliable and unjustified assumptions. Um, interestingly, uh, the uh, applicant, the NCA, sought leave to appeal and rather embarrassingly, they were refused leave to appeal on the basis that they had lost on so many points in front of the High Court that they had no realistic chance of overturning the decision on appeal. And then just to add insult to injury after losing the case, the agency was hit with an enormous legal bill totaling one and a half million pounds. Um, so, so those are three different real life cases all reported in the judgments and all giving perhaps a flavour of the sorts of circumstances in which UWA applications can be made and either succeed or fail. David, I think it's right to say that uh, the, the press love these sorts of cases and they tend to focus on the particularly on the lavish lifestyle part of the case rather than the, the yeah. law. Yeah. One gets the impression, at the very least, if one reads the, 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 the popular press, that there are loads of these cases uh, and yeah. that the state is pursuing many, many of these uh, people for these orders. Uh, the reality is slightly different. It, it, it is. I mean, you're absolutely right to say that the press love them. I, I remember in the case of Hadjiev, it was all over the papers and people will remember it because the press latched onto the fact that she had a Harrods um, credit card or, or gift voucher card on which she'd racked up something like 16 million quids worth of purchases in a day. I mean, I, I can't remember the figures, but it was some extreme example of conspicuous consumption. And of course, the press seized on that. So they do tend to get into the papers when they're made. But, but you're right, that creates a false impression. The statistics tell a very different story. They, they've been, if anything, significantly underused. The, the, the impact assessment for the criminal finances bill acknowledged that it was difficult to say how often they would be used, uh, but it estimated that there would be probably no applications in the first year because uh, all the agencies would be on a steep learning curve, but that there would be likely to be around 20 unexplained wealth orders per year after that. And in fact, the initial figures uh, seemed to bear that out, or the initial indications, I should say, seemed to bear that out because it was reported in January 18, so very soon after the orders first became available. And I think I mentioned this in an earlier answer, in fact, that the director of the SFO was trawling through uh, all of their then casework looking for suitable cases. But in fact, they brought no applications. And again, by about three months after the uh, new powers came into force, after the, the act came into force, uh, the uh, director of economic crime, the director for economic crime at the National Crime Agency made a public statement that his officers were working on around 100 other cases and that he expected around five more unexplained wealth orders to be secured within the next three months. But in fact, the position is very different. As of last month, and this is the most up-to-date information I have, and I hope that nobody's going to embarrass me by saying that I've missed something in the last month, but certainly as at February of this year, uh, I think early February of this year, there had been only nine unexplained wealth orders in total. Uh, even that is slightly misleading because they related to only four different cases. Uh, they, they had an estimated total value of, <clears throat> excuse me, just over 143 million, and they'd all been obtained by the same agency, as I've mentioned, the NCA. No other enforcement body, including the SFO, had obtained any UWOs, and perhaps most tellingly of all, Salish, and this may have something to do with the that whacking cost order that was made against the NCA in the case of Baker, there have been no unexplained wealth orders obtained at all since the end of 2019. So uh, they are being used far less than was suggested when these uh, new apparently draconian powers were first being canvassed and, and touted by, by the government. Yes, thank you, David. Before we go on to the next section, um, can I just read out one or two of the questions that we've had? Uh, I think 
David, to be fair, you probably answered Helen Chater's uh, question. Uh, do you have a view on why so few applications uh, for such orders have been made? Uh, and of those that have been made, do you know uh, whether more were based on PEP or serious crimes data? I think you've, you've dealt with the, the three cases. Uh, and we've had a question from Lorna uh, Empson. Um, her question is, uh, how has the Economic Crime um, T&E Act of 2022 impacted on obtaining uh, unexplained wealth orders and the cost, etc.? Uh, and I think you, you've, you've again at least yeah. part answered that question. Uh, I, I, I can. Uh, I mean, dealing with Helen's question, I, I have part answered it. I suspect it's partly the, <clears throat> the cost implications. Um, if I was going to be very controversial, I'd suggest that uh, agencies that are pursuing these sorts of orders need significant funding. And on any objective view, they've been starved of the funding they need in order to be able to develop cases in the detail that they that they, they need. So those are really two flip sides of the same coin, aren't they, um, Salish and Helen? Uh, uh, the, the danger, I think, of, of having swinging costs order made against one and, and the, the, the under-resourcing in order to develop the cases and, and the balance uh, between the, uh, well, I've dealt with the balance between the, the two limbs of um, either serious crime or PEPs. Um, as for Lorna's question, uh, she's absolutely right to focus on the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act of 22. A very prescient question, because it just happens, I think, to be, do I have a slide on that? Or perhaps I don't have a slide on that. Um, uh, but, but, but she's right to mention that act. It's, it's only just uh, received the Royal Assent. It was fast-tracked through Parliament, uh, received, received, received the Royal Assent on the 15th of March, of 2022 and it does uh, a number of things it, it doesn't just deal with uwos uh, so by way of example um, it also deals with the question of a uh, property register in order to prevent and combat the use of land in the uk by overseas entities as a means to launder money or to invest illicit funds and in order to increase transparency and public trust it said in overseas entities which are engaged in land ownership in the UK. Part one of the 2022 Act makes extensive provision to set up a register of overseas entities and their beneficial owners. And it requires overseas entities in certain circumstances to register um, on that, um, that register. And the intention obviously is to require those sorts of overseas companies that currently own UK property to reveal their ultimate beneficial owners. So that's one step it takes unrelated to UWOs. <clears throat> Another step it takes is to make certain amendments to the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2018. But, but I think what um, Lorna is probably driving at is part two of the Act, which makes a number of amendments to the UWO regime, uh, essentially four key changes. Um, and uh, I think we can probably... So, David, think, David, yes. Oh, we've got a slide up. Yes, there we are. The, the reason, the responsible officer provision, section 362A, the unlawful conduct provision, extension of the determination period, and the costs cap. Those, those are the four main amendments, the four key amendments which are made by the 2022 Act in relation to the UWO regime. David, do we have time to, to just a, a couple of sentences in relation to each of those? Uh, yes, uh, I think we do. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, responsible officer, uh, it really comes to this. In order to ensure that individuals can't hide behind complex ownership structures, uh, the 2022 Act introduces a new category of person referred to as a responsible officer of the respondent property holder. And uh, th they may be specified in a, an unexplained wealth order where the respondent is an entity rather than an individual. And it can in include directors, uh, managers, partners, uh, members, or their equivalents. It it it's, it's meant to be a mechanism to enable uh, law enforcement to uh, cut the Gordian knot, if I can put it that way, of the sometimes immensely complex Byzantine uh, offshore 
corporate structures uh, in which the, the true ownership of the uh, property is hidden. Uh, the unlawful conduct provision, uh, that's a fairly radical change. It, it really radically changes the income requirement. It expands the so-called income requirement so that um, as an alternative to being satisfied that there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that the known sources of the respondents lawfully obtained income would have been insufficient for the purposes of enabling the respondent to obtain the property in question, that that requirement can now be satisfied instead if the High Court is satisfied that the property has been obtained through unlawful conduct. So it's a, uh, in a sense a more difficult but a more direct route to jumping that particular hurdle. Uh, the uh, extension of the determination period, we've seen um, how where there's an IFO in place, uh, the enforcement authority has 60 days to decide what to do next when the respondent actually provides or purports to provide the information sought. And effectively what the amendment does is to uh, slightly relax that requirement by uh, introducing a provision which allows for an application to extend the 60-day uh, determination period. Uh, and then the, the final point, and this may be, um, may yet be the most effective, I don't know, is what I've referred to as the costs cap. It's section 362 of you, and, it, and it's rather familiar um, to us uh, in the criminal justice field from other contexts effectively that new section is inserted to provide that the High Court cannot order enforcement authorities to pay the costs to a respondent or to a specified responsible officer in respect of any UWO application unless the applicant enforcement authority has acted unreasonably or dishonestly or otherwise improperly. So very, very limited circumstances now um, in which the NCA or indeed any other enforcement body uh, will have costs ordered against it, even if it fails to obtain the order for which it applies. So those are the four main amendments made by the 2022 Act. Thank you, David. Can I, uh, before I turn to Leon, can I just read a question from Patrick Stevens? Uh, and those who are fans of Father Ted may well say this is a medical <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> If unexplained wealth orders are failing and the lack of applications suggests strongly that they are, says Patrick, uh, what next? Do we give up or, or do we uh, change how we pursue the flood of dirty money? Uh, if the latter, how? And, and that neatly, I think, ties in, Leon, uh, with a question I was going to ask you about interim freezing uh, orders, uh, what the provisions are. Yes. Um, so essentially, when applying to the court for an unexplained wealth order, the relevant enforcement authority may also apply at the same time for an interim freezing order. This freezing order prohibits that person served with the unexplained wealth order or any other persons with an interest in the property from dealing with the property, for example, by selling it. Um, in the absence of a freezing order, a person receiving the unexplained wealth order who knows they may not be able to comply may attempt to sell the property and um, make off the money. This will obviously undermine the whole point of the unexplained wealth order. So it therefore seems very likely that almost all applications for unexplained wealth order will be accompanied by an application for an interim freezing order. Thank you. Um, so, was, was it Patrick who asked the question? It was, but there's a lot of dissimilar questions from Jonathan as well. Right. Can, can I hazard, uh, hazard uh, a response? Um, I would suggest um, perhaps four things. Um, first of all, to be blunt, uh, more resources for enforcement agencies. Uh, there is chronic underfunding. All the statistics show that there is chronic underfunding for the agencies that, are, that have been vouchsafed this power. Um, the second is much greater emphasis on training and expertise and continuity and um, you know, preventing a massive turnover of manpower within those agencies, so allowing them to develop specialist teams and specialist expertise. The third is the age-old plea for joined up thinking, and in particular cooperation, interagency cooperation between all the various agencies um, that are given these powers. Um, I, I suspect that that will lead to 
uh, better and greater results. And probably the, the fourth answer is the one that the government is now uh, recommending, um, or at least the Treasury um, Committee, Select Committee, is recommending uh, in their um, economic crime report, which came out, I think, in, again in February of this year, so only last month. Uh, one of the key recommendations, and, it, and it, in a sense is an old chestnut, but it, 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 it's probably more relevant now than ever, um, one of the key recommendations is consideration of whether to centralise economic crime policy in one government department and uh, enforcement against economic crime in a single agency. So that, that's, that seems to be the line that the government is likely to go down in an attempt to make the UWA regime uh, work in a way in which hitherto it plainly has not been working. Uh, thank you. I think that neatly brings us uh, to the, the end of the, the webinar. But we've done it with, with one and a half to two minutes to spare. Um, Clyde, just in relation to that last question, and David, the last point, uh, yeah. a couple of things, one for you, Leon, and one for, for David. Um, Leon, firstly, um, this is clearly an area that's going to grow as far as your firm uh, is concerned uh, and uh, other firms in this area. And we're not limited just to uh, Russian oligarchs, I suspect. No, that's correct. And obviously, our firm represents a lot of Chinese clients. So we are concerned that this, at some point in time, will extend to Chinese oligarchs, which will obviously have a big impact. Uh, and David, this is uh, uh, perhaps a more difficult one, uh, really carrying on the, the, the thread of the last two questions. Yeah. Whatever one's political view, whether one's left or right uh, in terms of politics, uh, whether one believes that the Conservative uh, government actually does want to do something about the dirty money that, that everyone's talking about in the press, the fact is they're going to have to do more uh, for political expediency, aren't they? I, I think the political pressure is going to become unbearable. I mean, if one were a cynic, <clears throat> one would say that the reason that it's been under-resourced so far is that there's been a political calculation that the public don't care that much because it doesn't directly impact on the public. Of course, as a result of the recent tragic events um, in the Ukraine, the public is now um, focused in a laser-like way on the question of dirty money, um, oligarchs in London, uh, the, the London laundromat and so on and so on and so on. So I think the political pressure is going to become unbearable. And it's interesting what you say about whether you're approaching this from the left or the right of the political spectrum. Uh, we all ought to want the same thing. It may be that we want them for slightly different reasons. It may be uh, that those um, uh, of, of a left-leaning inclination um, are, if anything, uh, more aggravated uh, about the idea of uh, uber wealthy individuals coming here and basically um, buying influence in our society uh, and um, being above the law and being able to break the rules with impunity because of the uh, because of the influence that they uh, they're able to purchase. I would say that the right wing should think that too, but it may be that the left wing think it more. The right wing is supposed to be the, the party of law and order. I mean, how can the how can the party of law and order? Uh, not be interested in funding properly agencies uh, which are absolutely at the heart of, at the coalface of uh, combating fraud and corruption on a massive scale, which does inordinate harm to our society. Uh, so, so, so there ought to be a political consensus, even if the balance of reasoning that leads to the same result is, is slightly different. This is clearly going to be a fast changing area uh, that the press is interested in, therefore the politicians uh, will at least follow, if not lead. And so uh, we're probably going to have far more cases of this sort, uh, and I suspect fertile ground for lawyers on both sides, uh, and therefore no doubt fertile ground for another webinar, uh, I suspect fairly soon uh, as the law develops. That leaves me really to thank both of our panellists. Uh, Leon, thank you very much, really useful, and, and you, I can tell from the comments we've had uh, how people have found uh, the, the webinar uh, useful and relevant. And David Wallbank, uh, as ever, thank you very much. Uh, incisive comments uh, and uh, um, we've learnt much. Can I also thank the audience for tuning in, so to speak. Um, those that have questions but haven't had them answered or want to ask them, 
feel free to contact David or myself or Leon. We will do our best to answer individual questions. And also the, a video, a slightly edited version of the video will be available. And I think David will also make our slides uh, available to, to all of the, the participants and uh, any of the, the people that couldn't make it. So on behalf of everyone, thank you, David. Thank you, Leon. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.